Henry Ford, one of the most influential American industrialists, transformed American life through his company. In this video, we're going to learn how he did it, starting from the very beginning. By all accounts, Henry Ford should have been a farmer. Born in Michigan barely 20 years after it had become a state, Henry grew up at a time when farming was slow, exhausting, and manual. Unsurprisingly, he came to hate it with passion. However, unlike most people at the time who couldn't escape their circumstances, Henry was lucky enough to get such an opportunity. The village he was born into was just eight miles west of Detroit, which was rapidly becoming an industrial center thanks to the steam engine. Early in his childhood, Henry encountered technology that few children his age could play around with. He would tinker with the watches of his better-off neighbors, and by the time he was 12, he could not only take them apart, but also put them back together and repair them. His interest grew into an obsession when he observed a working steam engine firsthand on a school trip to one of the rail companies in Detroit. By the time Henry had become a teenager, the steam engine was making its way into the farming community. Co-powered threshing machines and sawmills were becoming a common sight, and Henry was learning how they worked and how to fix them. At the age of 16, he made a big leap forward when, against his father's wishes, he left his village to work in Detroit, where any young mechanic could easily find very lucrative employment. The industry in Detroit was booming, and it had been doing so for close to five decades. In 1825, a canal had been dug connecting the Hudson River to the Great Lakes, effectively the western frontier at the time. All the untapped resources that had no way of getting out could suddenly be moved by steamboat to New York. In just 50 years, Detroit's population increased by a factor of 10, with vast mines in the north producing copper and iron, and lumber mills opening up virtually everywhere. All this metal and wood sustained close to a thousand companies in Detroit alone, including the ones where Henry would work during the 1880s. During this time, Henry by chance learned about the gas engine from a British magazine. It was being produced in small numbers by a German engineer, Nicholas Otto, and gaining traction in Europe. However, it was practically unheard of in America. Henry got the chance to work on such an engine in 1889 and instantly recognized its advantages because it did not use steam. The engine was much lighter and eliminated the need for a heavy boiler and all the water in it, as it did all the combustion internally, a much more efficient process. This also allowed the gas engine to start quickly, whereas steam engines of the time needed as much as 30 minutes to heat up the water and generate enough steam to start working. The gas engine was an innovation that Henry fell in love with. Henry had extensive experience with steam and metal, but he didn't fully understand electricity and the gas engine. To bridge this gap in knowledge, he went to work for the local branch of the Edison Illuminating Company in Detroit in 1893. The company generated electricity for over a thousand homes using steam engines, making Henry a natural hire due to his expertise. As the chief engineer, he fixed engines when they broke, and in his free time, he experimented with gas engines. In 1893, Henry, now promoted to chief engineer at Edison, created his first working gas engine. The idea of using a gas engine to create a horseless carriage had been in Henry's mind since he first saw one. However, turning this idea into reality proved challenging in a world with no readily available car parts. Through trial and error, Henry spent three years building his first car, the quadricycle, a simple frame with an engine powered by ethanol and four bicycle wheels. Despite its simplicity, the quadricycle had its challenges, including no reverse gears and a lack of a cooling system, causing frequent overheating. Henry made continuous improvements, adding a cooling system, and by 1897, he sold it for $200 after driving a thousand miles. Henry's confidence grew, and he built subsequent quadricycles, refining the design. In 1899, he started his own company, the Detroit Automobile Company, capitalized at $150,000, with investments from Detroit's elite. 
However, building complex machines in large quantities proved more challenging than Henry anticipated. Parts were sourced from various companies, causing delays, and the shareholders grew impatient with his slow progress. By the end of 1902, they voted to remove him from the company, leaving Henry with only $1,000. Undeterred, Henry took a different approach, focusing on designing a vehicle for the average person rather than targeting businesses with expensive machines. This marked a departure from the prevailing trend where cars were high-ticket items crafted individually for racing. Over the next five years, sustained by support from friends and family, Henry iterated through 20 different designs, with the production process evolving significantly. This period taught Henry the importance of having a reliable supply chain. When his first company failed, Henry tried a different approach this time by sourcing as many parts as possible from the same manufacturer. The one he chose was the Dodge Brothers Company, a machine shop in Detroit that would later evolve into the eponymous American brand. However, the most significant game-changer was Henry's chance visit to a slaughterhouse in Chicago, where he observed a disassembly line. Multiple workers processing carcasses moving down the line. Inspired by this, Henry envisioned using a similar process in reverse, creating an assembly line. Using money saved from earlier models assembled by the Dodge brothers, Henry established his own factory in 1904 to experiment with the assembly line process. By 1905, the Ford factory employed over 300 people, producing 25 cars a day. However, Henry faced challenges as he was simultaneously producing multiple different models, hindering the effective use of an assembly line. Despite this, the affordable Model N, created in 1906, became the best-selling car in the U.S., making Ford the biggest car producer in America. During the production of the Model N, Henry implemented the assembly line process, albeit not a full moving assembly line. Nevertheless, this experiment increased production by a factor of five. Recognizing the importance of logistics, Henry founded the Ford Manufacturing Company in 1905, with its own factory dedicated to making engines and transmissions for his cars, eliminating potential delays. Perhaps the most unexpected factor in Henry's success came from Peru. In 1907, he began constructing a heat treatment plant to produce vanadium steel, a new alloy in America. Few furnaces in the U.S. could reach the necessary temperature for its manufacture. Despite the challenges, producing vanadium steel was worthwhile, as it was more than twice as strong as regular steel while being lighter, providing a crucial edge in automotive manufacturing. At the time, vanadium metallurgy represented cutting-edge research, and Henry Ford had a fortuitous connection. He was friends with the Flannery brothers, Joseph and James, who owned the sole vanadium mine in Peru, producing 92% of the world's supply. The Flannerys had successfully commercialized vanadium steel in Europe and the U.S., selling it to rail companies. However, their Peruvian mine produced an excess of vanadium. In 1906, when they met Henry, they offered to help him transition his entire manufacturing process to use vanadium steel. The Flannery's chief engineer built the heat treatment plant for Henry in 1907, and their company supplied Ford with all the vanadium needed for its cars. The first Ford car designed with vanadium steel was the Model T in 1908. This alloy was the key to its success, as it wasn't the cheapest car Henry had produced. The Model N and its subscale versions were actually more affordable. However, the Model T surpassed competitors in strength, making it the best car at the time. The superior quality became its own marketing, and within weeks of its release, Ford received 25,000 orders, despite producing only 17,000 units for all of 1909. Henry Ford ushered in a new age in American history, the age of the automobile, and his company dominated it for the first two decades. It wasn't until the late 1920s that the rest of the auto industry caught up, but by then, Henry was already one of the richest men alive. In 1922, he took the time to write an autobiography. If you enjoyed learning about the man behind the Ford and the assembly line, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up 
and hit the subscribe button for more captivating stories from history. If there's a particular historical figure or topic you'd like me to cover in future videos, please let me know in the comments below.